Okay. So last time we ended off on the postpartum emotional changes. Um, so basically there's two that you really want to watch out for and it's postpartum blues and postpartum depression. So basically after your like first week of pregnancy, um, you can have something called postpartum blues, which is this like phase where you're basically emotionally a little all over the place or they can call that um being labile right where there's a lot of crying episodes they're irritable anxious and confused they still have pleasure and like they want to take care of the baby and stuff but um they just feel these overwhelming urges to cry and they just feel like very overwhelmed um, and they usually, like I said, they arise after like the first week of pregnancy, usually within like first few days, maybe even within the first five days. Um, and they usually just disappear after 10 days, like 10 days after the pregnancy. And they usually don't affect the ability for the mom to care or function. So she has no functional issues. She's able to perform her day to day activities and she's also able to care for the baby. Whereas postpartum depression is a little different. So um, when someone has postpartum depression, it's almost like what depressive symptoms would sound like, right? They'd be restless, they feel worthless, guilty, hopeless, moody, sad, overwhelmed. They'll be really tired. They'll have like these overwhelming feelings of sadness, anxiety. Um, but the key thing to know that they're in postpartum depression is that they lack interest in the baby and themselves, so they can't really do their day-to-day -day functions, and they're crying, like, all the time. So if these, you know, patients, um, when they give birth, and, you know, we start noticing them feel guilty, they're really sad, they say things like they're feeling hopeless, and they're not showing any interest in the baby, um, or even taking care of themselves, that's when we need to assess for postpartum depression. We also need to assess if they're at risk for harming themselves or even harming the baby. And we do that with um, a tool called the Enenberg um, Postpartum Depression Tool. Um, and we also look at if um, this woman has a history of, um, let's just say, other pregnancies with postpartum depression or if she has a family history of postpartum depression those are some things that could put her at risk for um getting um postpartum depression now um something else that i want to point out is that the treatment order usually goes first we're going to care for um always it's got to be having the mom supervised by somebody nobody can leave this mom alone if this um, person is feeling really depressed and worthless and hopeless. Um, and we also want to make sure there's someone with the baby, especially when the mom is with the baby, because she could harm the baby um, because of this postpartum depression. Um, we also want to put them into counseling and psychiatry if um, being with people and their symptoms don't really resolve. And we could also, as a final resort, give them antidepressants to help with their mood. But ideally, we want to have um, always someone with them, right? That's our first priority is making sure somebody's with them, making sure they're never alone with them or the baby, right? And then the other things. Um, so just as like a quick recap, when we're talking about postpartum blues, we're talking about usually within that like first week of pregnancy, right? And they still want to care for the baby and they have joy in taking care of themselves and taking care of the baby. That separates them from postpartum depression because postpartum depression, they don't have interest in the baby or themselves and um, they're basically um, at risk for self-harm and harm to the newborn. So those are like the major differences between postpartum blues and postpartum depression. And postpartum depression doesn't necessarily have to happen a week after pregnancy. It could take longer than that. But you just need to be aware that this can happen. Is there any questions about this? Okay. So 
now that we talked about like the different emotional changes that could happen after pregnancy, we're now going to talk about the newborn transitioning. So immediately when that newborn is born, right, the first thing that we need to do is do skin to skin contact with the mom and the baby. And that's because um, the babies need to have thermoregulation, okay? They can't be cold or experience hypothermia because that can affect other aspects of their lives. So, um, basically, um, when it comes to the newborn, you know, the first priority is when that baby's born, put them skin to skin. Um, and if that doesn't, um, if we did that, then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to dry them. So we're first going to do skin to skin for the thermal regulation, and then we're going to dry them. You're kind of doing them simultaneously because as you're putting the baby skin to skin, you could start wiping down the baby. So um, those are one of the things that like you think about, but you need to know, okay, when this baby is born, my priority is to put them skin to skin, and then I'm going to dry them. So after you're drying the baby and such, um, you will cover them with like this warm and dry blanket now, right? Because we're not going to use the same blanket that we wiped down the baby with. Then we're going to cover the head. And then once we've done all this, we're going to do an APGAR score, which we'll get into it more in detail in the next chapter. But basically the APGAR score is um, done at one minute and at five minutes and then possibly repeated again at 10 minutes. But basically what that means is one minute after birth. So it's this really quick process but um basically as soon as they're born we put them skin to skin we dry them we give them a warm blanket and we cover their head and then as soon as they're born within that one minute we do an apgar score then at five minutes and if let's just say they were both abnormal um you can correct me if i'm wrong but i believe um an apgar score should be above um eight i think eight and above is the score that um is the ideal um, but, um, if they don't have a high APGAR score, that can be concerning, okay, because there could be something wrong with the baby. That's why we need to check it at one minute and at five minutes, because this is their response to being out in the real world, right? Okay, it should be seven to nine. Okay, yeah, I knew it was somewhere, like, in that number. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't remember if it was seven or eight, but yeah, okay, so seven to nine. Seven to nine is where we're thinking of is a really good score for this baby, right? But the higher, the better. So um, definitely eight or nine is more promising, especially after birth. Um, but we also want to, besides doing an APGAR score, we want to have an ID, two on the baby and one on the mom and the partner so that we know how to correctly identify the baby. Because there's, you know, problems in the hospital where... Um, Babies can be stolen, so we want to make sure that the baby is properly ID'd, um, and we want to promote bonding, and we want to promote breastfeeding. We already talked about why they need to be breastfed. It's really so important um, after the baby's born to breastfeed. Um, okay, so um, here's other physiological transitions that can happen. So um, we have these four different areas we have circulatory shunts um which is basically where um but when the baby was in the like the stomach they had all these shunts like sending the blood to different places like we were talking about how like there's a shunt um that just basically uh transfers blood from the inferior vena cava and it passes the liver right we were talking about shunts that basically bypass um blood going from the lungs going straight to the body now those shunts close and the heart is acting more like an adult heart right because we don't have shunts in a normally functioning adult heart um we have uh, respiratory that we need to look at they need to be able to breathe spontaneously that's one of the um, reasons we do an apgar score um, they should have thermal regulation and they should have um, the ability to stabilize blood sugars. Now, there's a relationship between temperature and sugar. That's also one of the reasons why we need to cover them with a warm blanket because we need to make sure they have a normal temperature. And they get that also from skin to skin contact when they're born. But there's different things, right? So compared to a fetus, right? Um, which is usually like fluid filled and it's this high pressure system for respiratory. And like I said, blood was being shunted from 
um, not going to the lungs through that ductus arteriosus to the rest of the body. Now that shunt closes. So now it's a low pressure uh, system that has gas exchange, right? And it basically mimics what our um, hearts look like. Um, there's also um, gas exchange now being done in the lungs instead of the placenta, like when they were in the stomach. Now there's circulation through the heart, right? So in the fetus, they weren't really having that. Um, whereas now that closes and the left and the right atrium are able to do its thing. Um, their liver, right, wasn't getting any blood flow. We were talking about one of the shunts that also does that. Um, instead of having the shunt to the liver, right now that uh, ductus uh, veniosus, which would basically be the duct that would um, close blood flow from getting to the liver, is now closed. So now the liver can start its own circulation. Um, and lastly is thermoregulation, right? So the body temperature of the fetus is really maintained by the maternal body temperature, whereas now when the baby's born, um, it's maintained through the brown fat that the baby begins to develop and that flexed posturing. Um, so just to get like a little bit more in depth. So um, basically when the baby is born, right, we have, we're going from fetal to neonatal circulation, right? One of the things that we need to do is clamp and then cut the umbilical cord. Those are very critical things because the clamping and the cutting of the umbilical cord basically um, closes those shunts and um, the pressure increase, which basically allows the body to um, start performing normal functions, right? Like our hearts and our bodies do. So when we, um, you know, uh, put the clamp on the cord, um, basically the first shunt to close is that ductus veniosus, which is basically that shunt that prevents blood to go to the liver. Then is the foramen ovale, which is basically like, um, the shunt that basically gets blood from the right atrium to the left atrium without going through the lungs so that blood can go to the body. Then we have um, the ductus arteriosus, which we also said was another shunt, which is another way to basically just bypass um, blood going from the lungs. Um, but the last one to close is the ductus arteriosus. That is why it takes a few hours to typically see that. Um, and you could hear murmurs when a baby's born, but if they continue to persist, because it's, it's going to close within a few hours, but when they're first born, you may hear a murmur because they're still open, um, that ductus arteriosus. But, um, after that, it's not normal. So after the first few hours of life, it's not normal to still hear murmurs. Um, for the respiratory system, right, we were talking about they were going from that fluid-filled environment to air breathing. Now they're able to breathe, right? They need to be able to breathe so every other function can happen in the body. That's also why we do an APGAR score, right? So clamping of the umbilical cord also helps with that um, because it causes a buildup of oxygen, which is going to start those chemical changes to promote spontaneous breathing, and that first breath of life is going to be like the most important one because they're basically having a bunch of chemical changes happening at once. Thermoregulation changes, mechanical changes because of the closing of the shunts, the first time their lungs are actually ever being exposed to oxygen in the air. So they're going to take their first gas. And that's why a lot of times these like babies are crying and things like that because everything's all new, right? The alveoli start to expand. And because these are babies, right, their respiratory rates are actually going to be higher than an adult. So we typically see, especially as these newborns, 30 to 60 beats per minute with short periods of apnea, which means no breathing for less than like 15 seconds, right? That's normal for a baby, but that's why you need to count respirations for a full minute. If they're experiencing, you know, periods of no breathing that are longer than 15 to 20 seconds, let's say 30 or 45, that's concerning, okay? We don't want to see that. We also talked about temperature regulation, right? So um, we need heat and we need to prevent cold because um, that can affect the organs severely, right? So we need them to have a warm environment. 
okay? Because the cooler outside environment is also affecting the baby's thermoregulation. It was much warmer inside of the mom than it is out here. So we need to make sure we keep that baby warm. And like I said, our priority to do that is skin to skin contact, then drying them, then putting on right that warm blanket, and then the hat, exactly in that order. So um, another thing is that when a baby is born, their temperature could drop several degrees after delivery, that's okay, right? If it drops a little bit than what it was before, that's fine. But we still need to monitor temperature carefully because thermal regulation is related to the metabolism of sugar and oxygen consumption. So if one is affected, all of them gets affected, which essentially means, let's just say that temperature goes down, their sugar is gonna go down, which is going to therefore increase their respiratory rate and decrease their um oxygen saturation or the body's ability to carry oxygen around the body. This is not good, right? Because low sugar levels um, can be lethal, low temperature can be lethal, and being um, and hyperventilating means that you're not you know, um, retaining enough CO2, which can be harmful. And all of that means they're not breathing right, they're not having good thermoregulation, they're not having good sugar levels, this is all really bad. That's why you need to know, okay, if my temperature decreases in my baby, their sugar will decrease and their respiratory rate will increase. That's why you have to monitor all of these things. It's a cycle. Whatever happens to one is going to happen to other. So you have to really monitor them. And that's why we also want them to breastfeed so um, early within like that first hour after birth, right? Because we want to make sure they have those sugar levels because it relates to temperature and because it relates to respirations. Um, and newborn characteristics related to thermal um, stability, just more about it is that for the baby, right, like their skin is really thin and the blood vessels are even closer to the skin. So they get colder quicker. That's why we have to put them in that warm blanket. And they also have less subcutaneous fat, which means they don't have the ability to keep themselves warm. Um, so the other issues because of no subcutaneous fat, they don't have the ability to shiver for the first three months of life to produce their own heat. That's why we shiver, right? To give ourselves heat, but babies don't have that for the first three months. That's why we got to get them in a blanket. Normal temperature is 97.9 to 99.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Auxiliary, remember not putting anything in a baby's mouth and things like that. Um, always auxiliary temperature we're going by. And in order, if they have a little bit of hypothermia, like it's not within this range, that's why we're, um, we will do skin to skin uh, contact as the number one intervention for hypothermia. But that's also one of the reasons why we do skin to skin contact as soon as they're born. Um, they could also have like other reasons for heat loss, right? Like cold stress can be lethal, right? So because of that cooler outside environment, they're at risk for hypothermia. Um, and they also have like rapid heat loss from like evaporation, conduction, convection, and radiation. Um, definitely know what those are. We're going to go into them now, but just know them, know how you see them in the slides if there's images, because that's, she's definitely going to ask about these. So when we're talking about conduction, right, this is basically when, um, the skin or the body becomes in direct contact with something that's colder than the skin. Like, for example, the nurse's hands, a stethoscope. That's why you need to warm anything before you touch the baby. That's why we have warm blankets. That's why when you're in your OB rotations, you might have seen like those little newborn um incubators. I like put them in and not like the incubator, but like they're like in those little um I don't know what the word is, but they have like the heating thing on top. Um, they have that so it prevents, you know, hypothermia. But obviously priority is skin to skin contact, but we could give them warm blankets, um, you know, have warmers in the room, make sure their environment's more warm and make sure you warm anything before you touch the baby. Convection is when you have transfer of heat to the air surrounding the newborn. So, for example, like a draft, right? So the baby's heat now goes into the air. So that's why we need a warm, draft-free environment and keep doors closed, okay? The next issue they could have is evaporation, right? Which is basically um, the baby loses heat because the body is wet. So wet linens, wet clothes, bathing, their temperature is going to decrease. So that's why we need to dry the baby. So if it's evaporation, we're going to dry them.
Think of, okay, evaporation, they're wet, I have to dry. For radiation, it's a transfer of heat to cooler objects not in direct contact with the baby. So um, basically this means that like, let's just say the crib is placed near the window, that could transfer heat from the body to the window. So we wanna keep babies away from windows or outside walls. You wanna keep um, cold equipment away from the baby, like not with, like in a close distance and do not place the baby near anything cold. Imagine almost like, um, like the baby has like a little force field around it, right? And there's certain things within its perimeter, if it's close enough, that can actually target the baby, even though it's not in direct contact with it. So no outside windows, no cold air, things like that, right? Um, no cold objects, whatever. But, right, if they were to continue to have hypothermia, this can lead to increased oxygen needs, respiratory distress, hypoglycemia, and an increased risk of jaundice. That all relates to that little triangle that we spoke about, um, which is why it's so important to know how thermoregulation affects the newborn. Is there any questions? So the next thing is how to manage a newborn. And like I said, one of the things that we do is the APGAR score. Now, my like your notes might have been different from mine. Mine was eight to 10, four to seven and zero to three. But if yours is seven to nine, go by whatever the numbers are. Um, but these were the ones that were in my book last year. Um, but regardless, you know, definitely like um, less than like, seven, no good. Okay. So that, like I said, all the notes are a little different, but these are the ones that I have in mind, eight to 10, four to seven, zero to three. So I would just say, check with your slides, you know, make sure you have the same ones that are in your notes. But, um, we do an APGAR score at one minute and at five minutes. So like, I'm just going to use mine for reference. So let's just say eight to 10 or seven to 10, right? I'm seeing uh, different things. I'm seeing seven come up. So I'm going to say seven to 10, right? That means pretty, pretty normal, right? So um, how do we do this? Well, this is actually something you're going to have to memorize. This is not something that's going to be provided to you. You're going to actually have to know this. So the first one is activity and it relates to muscle tone. Um, if they use the words absent or flaccid movement, that's a zero. You'll give one point to the baby. If they say flexed arms and legs or some movement, that's one point. Two points would be active movements. They're worming all around. All the extremities are moving. That's two points. Um, the P in APGAR is for pulse. So you palpate the umbilical cord, right? Because, you know, we're not, we, they don't have the pulses that we can palpate fully yet, but we need to look at that umbilical cord. If it says absent pulses, that's a zero. If we have a heart rate below 100 beats per minute, that's one point. If we have a heart rate for that baby greater than 100 beats per minute, we give two points. Um, for grimace, um, we have, that means just like a reflex um, irritability or what does the face look like? That's also what it means. We give zero points for floppy or no facial movement. We give one point for minimal response to simulation, like a groan or a grimace. And we give... Um, Prompt response to stimulation, such as crying, cough, sneezing. If they have things like that, they're crying a lot. They're screaming, crying. That would be two points. Now, something else to note is if they have, um, if you give two points for crying, you also give two points for respirations because vigorous crying means that they're breathing. So if you give two points for a really, um, for a lot of crying, you also give two points for respirations. The next A is for appearance or skin color. If they're blue, pale, meaning they're cyanotic, that's zero points. It's one point given if the body is like pink, but the extremities are blue. That's called acrokinosis, which is normal. It can be a normal finding post-delivery. Um, and two points is if they're pink, but you don't always see a pink baby. So you typically see acrokinosis. That's why like seeing a APGAR score of 9 out of 10 is still very good. Respirations, if they're not showing any respiratory effort, that's a zero. If they're slow and irregular, meaning that respiratory rate is less than 30, we give one point. If that respiratory rate is um, greater than 60, like we said, if they're crying, we give two points for respirations and two points for grimace. So um, that is very good. 
And when it comes to the APGAR score, she's going to give you a scenario and you're going to have to figure out how many points can be awarded to this scenario for that baby. Okay. Um, so other things that we need to look at when we're doing the physical exam when that baby's born is that the head circumference should be 32 to 38 centimeters. The chest circumference for the baby should be two to three centimeters equal or less than the head circumference. So um, let's just say the head circumference is 32, then we expect the chest circumference to be like 30 or 29, okay? Um, let's just say, um, you know, it was like 36, then we're looking at 34 or 33 centimeters for the chest circumference. Um, vital signs, like we said, temperature 97.9 to 99.7 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll need to know that. Heart rate should be 110 to 160 beats per minute. Remember, they can have heart murmurs, especially during the first few hours of delivery. Um, respiratory rate is 30 to 60, and oxygen saturation is greater than 95. So, nursing actions, right? We're doing the, phys uh, the physical exam. Always priority is airway, just like in every other system, right? Um, and then we want to make sure we have proper identification or bringing the right baby to the right family. And we also give other medications. So we can give erythromycin 0.5% or 1% tetracycline for an eye ointment to prevent bacterial infections, conjunctivitis, um, such as from things like gonorrhea or chlamydia. You'll need to know that you give erythromycin 0.5% or 1% 1 uh, 1 tetracycline um, ointments for conjunctivitis. You're also going to give vitamin K because babies don't produce vitamin K when they're first born. It's also called aquamephatoin, um, which is ba basically, right, vitamin K is increasing in clots and babies don't have vitamin K. So we give them vitamin K to increase clotting and reduce the risk of bleeding. That hepatitis B vaccine must be given prior to leaving the hospital. Um, we also, um, if the mom is hepatitis B surface antigen positive, meaning that they have hepatitis B, we also want to give the baby hepatitis immune globulin, okay? Because that's also going to help to make sure that the baby doesn't get it. Um, we also want to look at, you know, uh, prenatal history and newborn physical exam, but this is very important on what sorts of medications you're going to give when they're born, okay? And always, um, for just quickly for vitamin K, since it's a um, injection type of medication, usually give it as an eye, like a um, intramuscular injection. You're gonna give it in the the thigh, um, with like a twenty five gauge needle. Because remember, the higher the gauge, the smaller the needle, and you're gonna have to hold that leg to give it. And if you are lucky, you'll be able to do that when you're in your clinicals. Usually, some instructors might allow you to help that or assist nurses with that. Um, okay, so we already talked about um, all of the variations in terms of like vital signs and what sorts of medications we give. We also have to look at the skin. There's a lot of skin changes that happen. So we said that pink or tan with acrocyanosis is normal, right? So they're pink, but their extremities like the hands and the feet are blue. Now here are some other normal variations and I have pictures down here so it helps a little bit so vernix is that white cream on the baby's body which is the first picture langu is basically like the hair um or lango I don't know how I say it like that um is the hair on the baby that they have all over um melia which is basically this um sebaceous cyst on like the forehead the nose, the chin, the cheek, that's basically this image over here. Um, for um, basically a stork bite on the neck or telangiectatic nevi, I don't know how to say that, but stork bites, or they could also be called salmon patches, are on the back of the neck, and they're like a red mark that fades over time. So we're looking at like a picture like this. Um, it's normal if you see that. Um, strawberry mark or nevus vasculosis or hemog 
sarcoma. I'm going to say it like that. They're called strawberry marks, which are these raised dark red um, marks that can change in color and that they disappear over time. And just as an example, it's like that. It's like a raised mark. Um, we could also have a port wine stain, which is called nevis uh, flamius, which is, like I said, also called a port wine stain. It basically appears on the baby's face or other areas. Um, it changes in color and it tends to run in the family. So, um, this would be like an example of that. Um, we also have arrhythmia toxicum, which is a newborn rash, which is benign. It's idiopathic, right? It's generalized all over. It usually occurs in most babies within that first week of life, about 70% of them. And it's diffused rash. If we see this, like in this um, picture over here, we give no lotions, okay? We're not going to give that to the rash. Lastly, we have Mongolian spots, which can be also called congenital dermal um, melanocytosis um, or slate gray nevi, which are these benign blue purple like splotches usually on the lower back or the buttocks and they usually run in families like middle eastern asian or caribbean since mongolian spots are normal it's not a sign of abuse or anything like that okay um okay so those are normal skin variations that we could see in a baby newborn okay now, here's some other things, right? When the baby's born, the head, that anterior fontanelle, right, that's usually open, that diamond shape is going to close by 18 months. And that posterior fontanelle, which is the triangular shaped one, is going to close by two to three months. You need to know that because she's going to ask that. There's also other variations, right? where they have like molding, which is like an elongated shaping of the head. Basically, it's due to just like the head going through the birth canal. That's normal. But if we have capita succadeum, it's basically this like pitting edema that we see as a result of prolonged labor. And um, it's basically um, a molding, like a symmetrical round soft spot, kind of like... Um, this image right here, and you do not need interventions, okay? It's due to prolonged labor, but it's symmetrical, it's round, it has a little bit of a soft spot, but it still has molding, right? Because it has that elongated head shape, but it's okay. Whereas a cephalohematoma is basically when we have this collection of blood in the skull on the side of the head from a blood vessel rupturing. This is really not okay. This is due to a vacuum operational delivery. Um, and we need to watch out for jaundice. So if you see in these pictures, it's like a little bump that's coming out of the side of the head. That's a cephalohematoma. That's not good. We need to monitor for jaundice, okay? But the other two, molding or capita secadeum, those are normal. Um, we can also feel like pulsations over the fontanelle. Um, which relate to the baby's heart um, rate. You can see that on that anterior fontanelle, but you should not feel any pulsations on the posterior fontanelle. For like external genitalia, right, um, the medius tip of the penis should be midline. The scrotum should be pink to brown, symmetrical, um, pendulous with rugae, which is basically like those lines that you have, and the testes should descend. Is there any questions? Okay. So another thing is reflexes. Newborns are going to have a lot of different reflexes when they're born and they're going to disappear at different times. I don't think, I don't think she asked you when they disappear. I think she just wants you to know when, when they occur. Is that, is that correct? Like when you should see them or what they should be like? But regardless, I don't remember her testing me on the um, the types of like when they actually stop the reflexes. It was just more or less what reflexes should you see when they're born. Because reflexes are um, basically telling us no of their CNS, of their central nervous system. And if there is an absence of reflexes, this could mean that they have CNS damage. So... We have something called the Moro or the startle reflex, which is basically the baby startled. Um, the 
And the way you would test for this is you'd lift the baby's back up and then let go or clap in the baby's ear. And basically all four extremities are going to go up like this. They're startled, right? So you can either pick up the baby's back, they'll get startled, or you can clap in their ear and they'll get startled. The tonic neck or the fencing reflex is they kind of look like they're fencing. So one arm is up while the head is turned. Um, the arm is turned to the same side as the hand that's being raised and the other one is lower. They look like they're fencing. That's called tonic neck or the fencing reflex. We also have palmer and plantar grasp. So the baby will close its hand or foot around a finger or something like that to tighten its grip. That should be normal. So if you put your finger in the baby's hand or you put your finger on the baby's foot, they try to grasp it, right? The rooting reflex is stroking the newborn's cheek and the head should turn to the side stroked. Okay, so if you're going to stroke that left side, you know, their head should turn to that area. Um, And another reflex is the sucking reflex, which is basically if you give him like a binky or something, they will suck on it. There's also the Babinski reflex, which is the stroking of the sole, the lateral sole, the newborn's foot, from the heel across the ball, the foot to the toes, and the toes should start to fan out, right? So basically, you're going to take that baby's foot, you're going to stroke it down, right? And the baby's feet should flare, right? Like they're doing in this picture. The last reflex we should see is stepping. So baby steps is when you're holding them upright, like you're kind of almost standing them up. And um, basically you let their feet touch the ground and they start to step as if they're walking. They make like little walking motions and we expect to see that. I would know those reflexes because she does ask a lot about them. Um, okay, so um, the next thing is circumcision. Um, that's a really important topic. Is that is this on your quiz, circumcision? I don't want to go over anything that's not on your quiz. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, awesome. So circumcision is, there's a lot of responsibilities here. So pre-procedure, we need the mom to sign for consent for the baby. We also need a CBC on platelets. Why? Because remember, we said the problem with the baby being born is that they don't really have good clotting factors. So if we're going to do some sort of incision, right, we're going to be cutting things, they need to have a good platelet count and the baby needs to have vitamin K, right? So they have clotting, so they don't have um, as much bleeding if they are to bleed. The anatomy of the baby needs to be correct, meaning we need to check before procedure if they can pee. That's going to be a problem if they can't pee and then we start um, as the physician starts, you know, doing things to the penis. Um, we want to advocate for pain meds, specifically Elma cream, which is going to numb the area. It should be applied 30 minutes before the procedure. No breastfeeding two hours before. If they are breastfeeding and if they're bottle feeding, NPO four hours before, okay? We don't want to feed them anything. Um, cause you know, that can make them sick too and things like that. We, we don't want that. And the vital signs should be normal. During the procedure, the baby's going to be on a board. We're going to strap them down and we're going to use a clean solution to clean their body. And we're going to give a pacifier with sugar on it so that they can suck on it. Okay, so that can help distract them with the pain and stuff like that. Post-procedure, right? Remember, we gave them clotting factors. We gave them things to help them prevent bleeding. So we want to assess for bleeding every 30 minutes for at least two hours. Then we're going to apply a sterile gauze if there's excessive bleeding. Okay, so we always want to apply pressure with sterile gauze if there's bleeding. We also want to clean the diaper underneath um, and put a large amount of Vaseline on top of the penis to prevent friction and burning on um, urination. Okay, so we want to make sure that when they're post-procedure, uh, they have a nice clean diaper, they have Vaseline all, um, all over it, and um, so that it helps with preventing, like I said, friction because it's really sensitive right you're cutting a piece of skin off um make sure you give the baby to the mom and feed him right and the baby must be able to avoid post-procedure right if they were able to pee before they should be able to pee after when they bring the baby home one of the things that we need to tell them is hey it's going to take a few weeks to heal the vaseline must be applied to every diaper change yellow white exudate or like 
little crusty like things around the penis area is going to be normal. Do not try to remove it and do not scrub down there because it's going to be sensitive. It's going to hurt. You don't do that. Okay. Now, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is promoting nutrition. So breastfeeding, like I said, we talked about that's the most optimal method and they usually do this for about six months. And the benefits for the mom and the baby is we already kind of talked about some of these, but some of them include that the uterus goes back to normal size quicker that there's more control of maternal weight when you're breastfeeding. There, It's cheaper, right? Because you are having, um, the mom has their own source of food to provide for the baby. And the baby gets antibodies, which means they have less allergies and even better weight control in the babies themselves. The contraindications include, let's just say they have like metastasis, right? We're not, they're not going to breastfeed if they have an active breast infection. We're not going to um, have them breastfeed if they have HIV, um, like actively and not active tuberculosis because those can spread to the baby. Now, here's how the stages of human milk work, right? So we have colostrum, which is basically filled with lots of protein, fat-soluble vitamins and minerals, and it has a lot of high levels of IgA and IgG, which are basically antibodies, right? And um, they're produced in the um, in pregnancy and they last several days after birth okay that's that's basically what we get in that beginning of pregnancy those first um, few days after birth we get this classroom then we have transitional milk which is basically day three to six and day 10 to 13 and then the last thing we get is mature milk which we have four milk which is the first milk that just leaves the breast and it's high in water vitamins and protein and then the hind milk is higher in fat concentration that's also why we teach the moms to only breastfeed for 15 to 20 minutes to get out the fore milk and the hind milk right because if they have either of those that could also increase um right engorgement provide pain maybe cause an infection because they're not getting things out so we want them uh the baby to be fed um 15 to 20 minutes and like i said they need to know proper technique for breastfeeding right um because if they do not grasp the areola and they grasp the nipple, it can hurt the mom. The baby's not going to be properly, um, have a proper amount of nutrients and it's not going to be good. So when we do initial feedings, like we said, within that first hour, we want to get them breastfed if we can. Um, establishing a feeding pattern. They should have, the baby should be fed eight to 12 times per day with no time limits, okay? If the, when the baby cries and says, hey, I need to be fed, we feed them. I mean, they're not gonna literally say it, but when we get the cues, we need to feed them. Feeding position is also really, really important, right? The baby needs to go onto the breast and grasp that areola, not the nipple, and it shouldn't hurt. And you could even put a pillow underneath the baby if that helps. We also have something called a latch scoring tool, which is basically when um you have a... Uh, a charting system that provides like a really good way to gather information about how that baby individually breastfeeds. So we will do that to determine um, if they are breastfeeding correctly. Um, if they're doing formula feeds and they're getting milk fortified with iron, never change that without the doctor's orders, okay? We are not going to do that because it could also increase, increase the risk for like anemia and problems so we're not gonna change um the formula feed if especially if it's milk fortified with iron we're not gonna change it without doctor's orders now um how do we know if the baby's getting adequate intake right whether it's formula whether it's breastfeeding well we should be able to hear swallowing if we hear the baby swallowing that indicates that the baby is getting breast milk and um that there's comfort that baby's getting milk they're comfortable while doing it and they're swallowing which means they're getting their nutrients any questions about any of that okay so the last thing is nursing management of newborn at risk so we already talked about the problems with like temperature and sugar levels and respiratory levels right so if someone, if a baby has hypoglycemia, which is a sugar of less than 40, know that if it's a sugar less than 40, we know they're in hypoglycemia, right? This means uh, they'll have tremors, they'll be jittery, they're going to be hypothermic, right? Because when sugar goes down, temperature goes down, they'll have poor feedings, they'll have respiratory distress, right? They'll have increased respiratory rate, right? As well as they get periods of apnea, 
and have cyanosis, as well as they'll have hypotonia or lethargy. So they'll have slow muscle reflexes, muscle tone, and they'll be confused. Okay. This is what we're looking for when we're thinking of hypoglycemia. This is our signs and symptoms. The nursing care is if we detect they're, that they're hypoglycemic, we need to screen within the first 30 minutes of birth. That's what we do. As soon as they're born, within that first 30 minutes, we screen. And we can give um, something called dextrosix um, to help with that if they have a low sugar level. Um, we also can give glucose gel or early feedings with formula to help control sugar levels because the baby can remember could become hypothermic and go into respiratory oh, shock. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You said um if we detect hypoglycemia, then we do what? Um we can give them um dextrosix, which is basically just like sugar. Um but let's just say um within that 30 minutes, right, we do see um a problem with the sugar, um, we're going to recheck the blood sugar uh, 30 to 45 minutes post-feeding. Because originally we want to try to feed them first with the mom's breast milk because, or just formula feed because that's going to have sugar in it. But if that doesn't work, we'll give them something else. I think I saw a hand raised as well. Yeah, I was just trying to clarify. Um, is it breastfeeding first or dextrose first or uh, dextrose then breastfeeding? I just wanted to clarify that because um, our clinical professor was saying something like that. I, I don't think she was conscious of it, but she was just saying it like something was going on and the nurse was like, oh, she's going to do something. And then she was saying it. I don't think her mind came to that. And it was busy, so... Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was breastfeeding first before you give the dextrose. Yeah, so it's going to be breastfeeding first because that could help raise the sugar level. But if that doesn't work, then and we recheck the sugar and it's still low, then we're going to give them like D5, um, D5W or D10W, which is also like dextrosic. Um, and it needs careful like titration. So we always want to breastfeed first because that could help change the issue and then we'll go to other means because that would be the least invasive so does that for uh, on the bold breastfeeding of formula feeding in children say that again will that um will that category like feeding first will it fall for both breastfeeding and formula feeding infants yeah because obviously like if that mom is not a breastfeeding mom we're not gonna be like oh, yeah put the baby on her it's gonna be like what are you doing but yeah if they have formula then we'll do that but we just need to feed them first okay thank you okay yeah so basically we're gonna screen within that first 30 minutes of birth if they have hypoglycemia which is a sugar of less than 40 we're gonna breastfeed them or formula feed them if that doesn't work by rechecking it 30 to 45 minutes after that feeding. If it's still low, then we're gonna give them something like D5W or D10W, things like that. And right while we're doing it, we need to assess for respirations and temperature because those correlate to blood sugar. And then, you know, obviously because this is a, a severe thing, we need to monitor um, the blood sugar levels via heel stick um, every hour for the first four hours of life and then every three to four hours until stable. Okay, so that's for sugar. The next thing is hyperbilirubemia. But there's there's something that I'm gonna talk to you when we get into this, because there's gonna be a physiological type of jaundice and there's gonna be a pathological type of jaundice. So hyperbilirubemia is basically jaundice when we have high total serum bilirubin level, which is a higher than five milligrams per deciliter. And remember, this is like yellowing of the skin, eyes, things like that. And we typically have different um, types that they can present with. So we have something called carinecteris, which is an abnormal accumulation of unconjugated bilirubin in the brain cells, right? Bilirubin shouldn't be there, but if it develops or it starts accumulating there, it can be really toxic to the brain tissues and it can cause deafness, delayed motor skills, hypotonia, um, which is like poor muscle tone and intellectual defects, okay? So we need to prevent um, carinecteris as we need to monitor the babies closely, okay? Um, 
jaundice, right, is something else that we could see, right? Because we talked about it's the breakdown of bilirubin. And it causes um, when bilirubin's in the body, right? Um, bilirubin is from a result of hemolysis of uh, erythrocytes or red blood cells. So red blood cells are breaking down, and that's what causes bilirubin to build up in the body, right? Um, and the thing with bilirubin is that it is released in this unconjugated form, which means that it's not soluble in water. And the liver has a really important role by changing that unconjugated bilirubin to a water-soluble form that can pass through this process called um, conjugation or conjugated or direct bilirubin. That's what we want. But um, conjugated bilirubin is not toxic to the body and it can be excreted. But unconjugated bilirubin is fat soluble and absorbed by subcutaneous fat and that's not good and remember we said unconjugated fat is a result of um, can lead to carinectaris and if that gets to the brain right it can cause um toxicity to brain tissues so that's why there's a really important role um that the liver plays in um functioning um that bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin which is what we want but jaundice can happen to a newborn and that can be okay right because like I said there's a lot of changes going on into the body and the red blood cells can be breaking down and causing hemolysis so physiologic jaundice or jaundice that occurs after the first 24 hours of age to so the first week of life is normal okay and it could be due to a, a few different reasons right it could be due to increased red blood cell volume, which is also called polycythemia, a short red blood cell lifespan, immature hepatic um, update, delayed passes of meconium, which is basically like stool. All of these things can affect um, the body and cause physiological jaundice, which is normal. It's just related to a little bit of some delays or some issues in the body, right? So we could test this through a total serum bilirubin, um, which will typically peak from days three to five of life. And um, the levels will get as high as 10 milligrams per deciliter. That's what we typically see. Remember, we said greater than five, right, is um, related to jaundice. So it will be greater than five, but it won't go as high. Um, it'll, it won't go higher than 10, right? That's physiologic. And we see it, keyword, after the first 24 hours of life. Non-physiologic jaundice or pathologic jaundice is before the 24 hours age. So you can see this as soon as they're born. And this is when there's an increase of five milligrams per deciliter per day of bilirubin levels. And they get greater than 20 milligrams per deciliter. Very bad. Now, this can be caused to RH incompatibility when the mom's RH negative and the baby is RH positive. We talked about um, um, hemoly hemolytic jaundice of the newborn. We also have ABO incompatibility when the mom is O and the baby is not O. That can cause pathologic jaundice. So we need to always assess risk factors, right? Like looking at the blood type and the blood screening, right? Assessing for the degree of jaundice, monitoring lab values such as hemoglobin, RBC, right? Because that's going to tell us about the RBC level and the bilirubin, right? Blood type and RH, direct Coombs. That's going to tell us if that baby right, is RH positive when the mom was RH negative, and the total serum bilirubin level. We want to make sure that the mom is adequately and the baby is adequately um, hydrated, right, um, and we want to implement phototherapy, right, if it's ordered, because that's going to help reduce the serum bilirubin levels. So that's the difference between the two, okay? So um, know the lab values that you need to know for those type, and when will you see them, what hours and stage of life, okay? Now, phototherapy, as we said, we could, that could help lower the bilirubin levels. And it does that is it uses these high-intensity lights to convert that unconjugated bilirubin to a less toxic, waterable, soluble form, that conjugated bilirubin, so it could be excreted in urine or stool, okay? Um, so what do we do? This is one of the most important things that they ask about. And I've seen this a lot on, like, practice ATI when it comes to um, 
photo therapy, it's, co it's commonly asked a lot. But one of the things is, one, you need to cover the baby's eyes and shield the genitals. Remember, this is a bright light going onto the baby. So we want to shield the genitals with a diaper and make sure the baby's eyes are covered, right? Imagine like a little baby like standing outside tanning. It's kind of like that. We're covering their eyes and we're making sure they have a diaper. They have minimal clothing, so nothing more than really a diaper. Okay, they need to have a neutral thermal environment, okay? That's why we need to assess the temperatures at least every four hours for this baby, okay? We need to provide optimal nutrition, right? They need to have feeding still while they're on this phototherapy every two to three hours to promote bilirubin excretion and to prevent dehydration, which means we need strict INOs, right, or intake and outputs. So, um... The stool could be loose and green, which means it may contain some bile, and the urine can be dark in color, okay? And we also need daily weights. We want to turn the infant every two hours to prevent any sort of, like, skin problems or skin irritation. Um, we also want to assess the skin frequently for drying and irritation, right? Look for cr uh, crackles, like, like cracks in the skin, and, like making sure to see if it's moist it shouldn't um you know it shouldn't be like super dry but it shouldn't be wet right and no lotions we don't want any lotions on the skin um we want to remove the infant from lights for feeding and bonding because they've been just exposed to lights for so many hours so we don't want to put them in front of lights when we're giving them feedings so we're going to remove the eye shields every now and then, right? And remove them away from those lights and look at the eyes, make sure there's no eye drainage, right? We want to monitor the serum bilirubin level at least daily. We want to teach parents, um, you know, the things that they should be doing, right? Like I said, like, you know, no lotions, make sure they're feeding them, turning them, all that stuff and promote bonding. Um, you must turn off the lights before you do a blood draw right? Because you don't want all of that going that could interfere with the blood levels. Because remember, it's removing the conjugated bilirubin, unconjugated bilirubin. So if it's removing that unconjugated bilirubin, making it conjugated so you can get rid of it, um, you don't want the lights on, okay? It could also, um, you know, prevent accurate lab values. And we want to discontinue, um, when we discontinue the phototherapy, um, we could see a slight elevation in the total serum bilirubin level. And we want to make sure that it's less than 10. When they're finished with phototherapy, we should see a total bilirubin, uh, total serum bilirubin level of less than 10. Um, just some other things. So when we're talking about newborns and we're talking about um, their lab values, we're talking about hemoglobin for a baby should be between 16 and 18 Hematocrit should be 46 to 68 percent. Platelet should be 150,000 to 350,000 um, microliters. Um, red blood cells should be 4.5 to 7.0 microliters. And white blood cells should be 10 to anywhere from 10 to 30,000 um, millimeters um, to the third power. And yeah. Is there any questions?